Hi! It's Romania Black, and if you have not watched my Berserk or Trigun manga reactions, um, you may be wondering, what a strange angle. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so one of the very first series that I watched on this channel was Run With The Wind. It was one of the first sports animes I got into. I fell in love with it. I have loved it. I constantly are reminded every year about the January 1st races, the New Year's Eve races, and it just fills the Discord feed. It's just, it's an amazing series and I love it to pieces, but it has been a long time since I've got to sit down and go through the entire series. And I knew that this was based off of a novel. And I've wanted to read the novel for a very long time, but the only fan translations I could find were on Tumblr or they were not really accessible. And then I found out they were doing a book in English and was like, ooh. And so Patron Zero Anti Zero was amazing and got me the book. <laughs> So we are going to be reading uh, over, hopefully, my goal is to hopefully be reading uh, this series leading up into the New Year's race. That would be amazing. Hopefully that, fingers crossed, will be able to happen. So I'm super excited about that, though. So, but yeah, run with the wind. This is not the cover I anticipated for it, but it's gorgeous. Um, I'm assuming, there. there is something about this cover, though, because I'm assuming this is a Kakaroo or Haiji. I'm assuming it's Kakaroo. But um, I... What is, what is this wrist thing on his wrist? This little watch. It looks like something from Ben 10. <laughs> it looks like Danny Phantom. What is this wrist thing that he has on his hand? It's so weird. I don't know if it's a charm or what it is. I don't understand what that is exactly. So I'm going to be very curious to see. But I like how his hair kind of becomes the color of the sunset. The wind kind of goes with it. It's very beautiful. I love it to pieces. But I don't know what that is. If it's a watch, it's a very interesting watch. But... Thank you, Zero Anti Zero, for getting me this book. I'm so excited. So, as it turns out, there are, um, we're going to go ahead and get ready and open this book. I have a podium here, and we're going to read, I'm not going to read the, the synopsis on the cover because y'all know exactly what this series is about. If you don't know what this series is about, this is going to be a fun read along. But yeah, so we're going to start and look at this here, and we're going to do that in three, two, one. So yeah, we got the front cover. I, I will note, unlike the manga that I am used to um, looking at in this in this channel, um, these pages of this book are extremely delicate. <laughs> As I'm adjusting my camera here, these are extremely delicate pages. Um, a lot more delicate than I anticipated. So using this is going to be interesting. But oh, look at this. Shion Miura, translated from the Japanese by Yui Kajita. I don't want to think of how long this took to translate, but basically this was originally written in 2006. I know the animated series came out around 2018, I think, um, which was like, it's crazy that this is nearly a 20 year old book is insane to me that this book is nearly 20 years old. So, oh, we have the eight leagues of Hakone. Mount Hakone is the most savage in the world, far more formidable than Hong Honguguan. Its peaks soaring to lofty heights, its ravines plunging deep. Onwards, the steep hill towers over the wanderer. Behind, the deep valley hinders. A sea of clouds swirl around the ridges. Fog obscures the valleys. The thick forest of cedar darkens the day. The winding paths are slippery with moss. One guarding the past, past will thwart an, enemy of, an army of thousands. The fearless warrior roams across the country, a sword on his waist, shod in tall getta, clacking over the ragged boulders across the weary road. Such was the beating and bearing of the bygone warrior. Okay, from 1901. Nice, fun. <laughs> so the table of contents, this is what made me think that we, I'm like, we could separate this out into, into 10 segments into 10 different parts. So we're going to be looking at the prologue and chapter one today. I don't know how long these readings will take, but I figured it would only make sense to do it in per parts. If this is only like a 30 minute video, then it's a 30 minute video. If it's two hours, it's two hours. But um, I want to do the prologue and the first chapter and then go by chapters. And then the final chapter, we would have the epilogue included with that. I'm super excited because I've been told I don't know exactly what is new, but I have been told that there are parts in the novel that was not adapted into the anime. I want to know if that's true or not. So, and plus it will be fun to just see 
all of the illustrations and everything at once. So for example, we have here, and I can finally take my finger off of it. Um, we have here the bathhouse and it shows you the top floor. So it shows you the different rooms, which is kind of cool. It's nice to see the bathhouse sort of illustrated here to see what the layout is. So we have the kitchen area and the dining room area. Then we have the first four rooms on the bottom floor. And then you have the bath area and you have uh, one, two, three, you have five rooms there at the top area. So there's really only um, nine rooms, which is interesting. So where the 10th person stays, I guess maybe there's like, maybe one of the rooms has like double beds, I think. Maybe it looks like possibly for the twins. That's interesting. But yeah, and there's Haiji walking other little dog there. So, so I'm excited. I'm so curious to see what we get from this novel, but I've been wanting to read this and I've held back and I'm glad. So thank you, Zero, for getting me this novel. Thank you, uh, YouTube. And mainly thank you to Patreon because a lot of patrons wanted to see me read this. So y'all are the reason I'm doing this. So hopefully you all enjoy. But um, let's start with the prologue here and just read along and we'll talk as we go, I suppose. So the prologue says, even in a place like this, only about a 20 minute walk away from Kampachi Dori, Tokyo Circular Route 8, in the opposite direction from the big city, the air cleared at night. On sunny days, warning alerts for photochemical smog were broadcast all day long, but at night, it felt like a different world. A hush fell over the residential neighborhood, lined with rows of small houses dotted by a few lonely streetlights. As he traced the maze of narrow one-way alleys, Haiji Kiyose looked up at the sky. It was no match for the starry night sky of his hometown in Shimane, but still, he could make out the tiny specks of light here and there. Wouldn't mind seeing a shooting star, he thought, but nothing stirred in the sky. A breath of wind skimmed his neck. Though it was nearly April, the nights were still cold. The chimney at Suru no Yu, a bathhouse he frequented, rose above the low rooftops of the houses around him. Kyose stopped looking at the sky and, bearing his chin in his padded collar of his doTERRA jacket he had flung on, quickened his pace toward Suru no Yu. Bathhouses in Tokyo were too hot for him. Tonight, he dipped in the bath after washing himself in the shower, as always, but the sheer heat of the water drove him out in no time. That made the local plasterer, another regular at the bathhouse, chuckle from his seat in the washing area. Your baths never last more than a second, Haiji. If Kyose left now, he wouldn't get his money's worth. So he sat down again on the plastic stool in front of the showers. He peered into the mirror and shaved with the razor he'd brought in with him. The plasterers sauntered past him, behind him, and sunk into the bath with a deep, satisfied groan. You know us Edo kids. We've always said a proper bath's got to do, got to bite your ass. That's how steaming hot it should be. The old man's voice echoed in the tiled room under the high ceiling. There was no sign of light from the woman's bath next door. Over at the watch seat, the owner of the bathhouse looked bored. He started plucking out his nose hairs a short while ago. Apparently, his only customers for the night were Kyose and the plasterer. Every time you say that, I think it's a good way to put it, but there's one thing I don't get, said Kyose. What's that? We're not in old downtown Tokyo. This is uptown Yamanote, so not exactly the place for Edo natives. Kyose finished shaving his face and approached the bathtub again, eyeing his neighbor to keep him in check. Kyose twisted the faucet and added cold water to the boiling hot bath. The cool liquid rippled through the bath, blending into the heat. Once he made sure it was mixed enough, he lowered himself into the tub. He hogged the space around the faucet and stretched out his legs in the water, now mellow enough not to scald him. If you can tell the difference between downtown and uptown around here, you're getting to be a local. The plasterer seemed to give up any claim of the faucet. He glided over the other corner of the bathtub, away from the water that was growing tepid. Well, I've been living here for four years now, Kyose responded. How are things doing in Chikyusei so? Does it look like all the rooms will be filled up this year? There's only one room left, but we'll see. I hope you find someone. Me too, Kyose agreed, and he really meant it. It's my last year, and I'm finally getting my big chance. Just one more person to go. He cupped some bath water in his hands and rubbed his face. There was no way around it. He simply needed one more person. The hot water nipped his cheeks. Maybe it was the razor burn. Kyose left the bathhouse with his neighbor. They strolled down the quiet street, the old man pulling his bicycle along. Thanks to the hot bath, Kyose didn't feel cold at all. 
Just as he was debating whether to take off his thick doTERRA, he heard the pounding footsteps and angry shouts from behind. He turned around and saw the shadows of two men in the distance, rushing pell-mell down the narrow path. One of them was running towards Kyose, his arms and legs slicing the air in precise strokes as he left behind the other man who was shouting something at him. As Kyose and the plasterer watched, the runner rapidly approached them, and by the time Kyose registered that he looked young, the man had already whizzed past them on the side of the alley. The second man, wearing a convenience store apron, was chasing after him, though he was lagging far behind. The young man had been breathing steadily as he brushed past Kyose's shoulder. Kyose almost started to run after him, but the plasterer's disapproving grumble checked his impulse, a shoplifter. What a shame. At that, Kyose realized that the sales clerk must have been yelling, Stop him! as the shoplifter ran past. But the clerk's voice had sounded like a jumble of meaningless sounds to Kyose's ears. Kyose's had been too spellbound by the young man's stride. How his legs propelled his body forward like a well-oiled machine. Oh, yeah, okay. Kyose grabbed the handles of the old man's bike. Let me borrow this. He pedaled as hard as he could without bothering to sit down, leaving his wide-eyed neighbor behind as he chased after the young man who disappeared into the night. He's the one. He's the one I've been looking for all this time. This conviction flared up inside of him like magma erupting from a dark crater. There was no way Kyose could lose sight of the runner. At single trail of light gleamed through the narrow alleys in his wake, the streak of light guided Kyose, like the Milky Way crossing the night sky, like the scent of a sweet flower luring an insect. Ah! Wind filled his doTERRA and it billowed out behind him. Finally, the bike lights caught the runner. Every time Kyose pushed down on the pedals, the white circle of light swayed from side to side across the man's back. Kyose observed the man's run while struggling to contain his excitement. A balanced form. A single straight line went down the runner's spine like an axis. His legs stretched out free and easy below his knees. His shoulders weren't stiff with excessive tension, and his ankles looked flexible, absorbing the shock of each landing. Light and supple, yet powerful too. Sensing Kyose's presence, the runner cast him a sideways glance as they passed under a streetlight. When Kyose saw the man's profile, illuminated in the dark, he let out a murmur of surprise. So it was you, he thought. An indescribable feeling roiled inside of Kyose. Whether it was delight or fear, he couldn't tell. Only one thing was clear. He was on the cusp of something about to begin. He sped up and came abreast of the runner. Then, without meaning to, as if under the spell of some obscure presence or spurred on by all from that deepest pit of his being, the question burst out of him, Do you like to run? The runner stopped abruptly, turning to face Kyose with an expression that hovered between troubled and angry. His glinting eyes, concealing a fierce passion in their boundless black depths, threw the question back at Kyose, and what about you? Can you answer a question like that? In that instant, Kyose realized something. If happiness or beauty or goodness existed in this world for him, they would take the form of this runner. This flash of conviction would live on in Kyose and continue to glow long afterward. Like the beacon cast by a lighthouse across a dark, raging ocean, the beam of light would unfailingly illuminate the path he was to take. The light would remain with him always, unchanging. Oh my gosh! Okay, well, before that, that's the prologue. So before we dive into chapter one, a couple things. One, this actually does happen in the anime, but it's much later. And here it's the prologue, which I like this as the prologue. Because even though it does work in context of the anime, because we get it from... In the, I, if I'm remembering correctly, at the beginning of the anime, we get this scene from Kakaru's perspective and Haiji is the outsider. And here it's later on in the anime, it gets reversed and we see it from Haiji's perspective. So we start out here with Haiji's perspective. I'm going to be curious to see if we get the rest of the story from Haiji's perspective or if it swaps back and forth. Second, y'all not beating the allegations. <laughs> I, I did have a lot of people say when I was watching the series that originally the author meant for this to be a BL and changed their mind for censor reasons. And I'm like, oh, we ain't beating the allegations here. <laughs> like, ah! Um, and then two, 
I just, I love everything about the imagery here and Haiji's perspective. And Haiji's my favorite character from the first, from the season. So I, if we have this from Haiji's point of view, I'll love that. But I feel like it might bounce between him and Kakaru. Um, but also, they also tie back to, you know, in the second episode, Haiji was trying to like, I believe it's the second episode, was trying to like out, outstand, um, Kakaru in the bath. So we establish here that Haiji is not good with hot water. So that's going to come back and be, you know, it'll, it'll tie back later on. So love it. Yes. Okay. Oh, I think we are going to get the rest of it from Kakaru's perspective, but this prologue was from Haiji's. Oh my God. Yes. Okay. So chapter one is the residence of Chikusei. So who knew running could be so useful? The rubber soles of Kakaru Kurahara's shoes pummeled the hard asphalt. He laughed silently, relishing the sensation of his feet striking the ground. He softened the impact of each stride by letting it flow smoothly from the tip of his toes into every muscle in his entire body. Wind whistled by his ears. He was heating up just under his skin. Without any conscious thought on his part, Kakaru's heart pumped out blood throughout his frame and his lungs drew in air in a steady rhythm. His body grew lighter and lighter. He could keep on running forever, but the question was to where and what for? The thought reminded him why he was running at the moment, and he slackened his pace a little. He listened intently for anyone who might be chasing after him. The angry shouts and footsteps were gone now. The bag of sweet pastry was rustling in his hand. As though to destroy the evidence, he opened it and wolfed down the bread as he ran. He wondered what to do with the empty bag for a moment before stuffing it in the pocket of his hoodie. He knew the bag itself would be concrete proof he'd stolen the pastry, but still, he couldn't bring himself to throw it away on the side of the road. Funny how that works, he thought. Mm. Nobody cared what he did anymore, but Cocker didn't miss a single day of training. It was an ingrained habit, just as he couldn't allow himself to litter the street. He'd been taught that it was a bad thing to do from when he was little. Whenever someone taught him something, as long as he thought it was reasonable, he'd faithfully abide by it. Once he set a rule, he held to himself to it with the utmost rigor. Perhaps the pastry had made his blood sugar level spike. His legs started kicking against the ground at a regular pace again. Feeling his heartbeat, he focused on his own breathing. He fixed his gaze on the feet in the road slightly ahead of him, his eyelids half closed. He looked only at the tips of his feet striding forward by turns of the single white line on the black asphalt. Kakaru ran, tracing the thin line. Though he couldn't bring himself to litter, he didn't feel any guilt for stealing the bread. He only felt satisfied to soothe his sharp pangs of hunger. I'm like an animal, he thought. Through daily, through daily training, Kakaru had built up a stable, resilient body. He'd stolen a bag of pastry from a convenience store because he'd been too famished to do anything else. In that sense, he was no different from a beast. Going around on a set route in his territory, pouncing on his prey when the need arose. Kakaru's world was simple and brittle. He ran. He ingested sources of energy in order to run, and that was basically it. Everything else was just vague, undefinable things undulating inside of him. But sometimes he could hear someone howling from within the wavering haze. As he ran swiftly through the night, Kakaru played a scene in his head, the same images that had been coming back to haunt him for the past year or so. Rage so violent that his vision turned bright red, the fist he'd swung as hard as he could. Maybe this is what regret feels like. The howl he heard from deep within must be the sound of his own voice reproaching him. He couldn't take it anymore. He let his eyes wander over the scene around him. Thin branches stretched out to form a mesh over the path. They would soon start budding, but he couldn't see any soft flecks of green yet. A single glimmering star hung from the tip of a branch. The empty bag in his pocket rustled like footfalls on dead leaves. Kakaru suddenly sensed a presence near him and his spine tensed. It was chasing him. Something was hunting him down. The creaking of the rusty metal was drawing closer. Even if he clamped his hands over his ears, he would still have felt the sensation through his skin. He'd, a, he'd taste of it countless times at track meets, the rhythm of another organism shaking the ground, the sound of breathing, the moment when a different smell enters the wind. A thrill ran through Kakaru's body and spirit. 
a rush he hadn't felt in a long time. But he wasn't running on a track that drew an infinite oval in an athletic field. He turned abruptly on the side street bordering an elementary school. His speed rose steadily. No one was going to catch him. He was determined to lose the pursuer. All the roads in this neighborhood, whether private or public, were narrow paths crisscrossing in a complex network, which meant many of them led to cul-de-sacs. Cockrew proceeded deftly, careful not to be cornered at a dead end. He dashed past the elementary school windows, which were so dark that they looked like they'd been painted by the night. He hurtled on as he looked sideways at the campus of the private university that he was supposed to start attending this spring. He came to a slightly wider road. He almost turned right in the direction of the circular Route 8, but he decided to keep running straight through the residential neighborhood. He crossed the street without stopping. The traffic light was on his side. His footsteps rang out in the quiet streets, but the pursuer seemed to ju be just as familiar with the lay of the land, and Cockeroo could feel him drawing closer and closer. I'm like, is this Haiji following him, I'm assuming? Once again, Cockeroo realized that he wasn't just running, but running away. A surge of frustration and regret clogged his throat. I'm always running away. Now he was even more desperate to keep moving. If he stopped here, it would mean admitting to himself that he was running away from something. A faint white light lit up the ground around his feet. The source of the light, which swayed slightly from side to side, clung to him, unwilling to let him go. So we're going back to this, yes! When he finally realized his pursuer was on a bike, Kakaru shook his head at himself. Though he'd surely heard that creaking metallic sound, he thought the thought hadn't even occurred to him that whoever it was could be riding a bike. But the creaking metal sound is Hygie's knee. Oh my gosh. Oh, but we don't know that yet. Oh! But Kakaru should have known from experience that hardly anyone could keep up with his speed on foot. <gasps> now the race felt ridiculous, and Kakaru glanced back. A young man was pedaling a typical mamachari, one of those casual city bikes with a front basket. It was too dark to make out the stranger's expression, but he wasn't from the convenience store. He didn't have an apron on, for one thing. This guy was wearing an old-fashioned padded jacket and plain massage sandals, the kind with the acupuncture, the acupressure bumps on the inner soles. What the hell? From the bathhouse. Just to see what his pursuer would do, Cockaroo slowed down. Creaking like a rickety water mill, the bike drew up next to him like it was the most natural thing in the world. Cockaroo stole a sideways glance at the guy. He had a simple, open face and his hair was wet. Apparently, he'd just gotten out of a bath. For some reason, there were two plastic bath bowls in the basket. The stranger was looking at Kakaru, too, especially at his legs. Slightly creeped out, Kakaru hoped the man wasn't some kind of pervert. <laughs> the man was silent, pedaling next to Kakaru while keeping a slight distance between them. Kakaru also maintained a steady pace, watching for his next move. Did that sales clerk ask him to chase after me, or is he some random dude passing by? Just as Kakaru felt he might explode with anxiety and irritation, a serene voice watched, washed over him, like the sound of distant waves. Do you like to run? Kakaru stopped dead in surprise, as if the road in front of him had suddenly fallen away, and he was stuck, bewildered, on the edge of a precipice. He stood rooted to the spot in the middle of the dark, quiet street, his heart pounding in his ears. The bike screeched to a halt. Kakaru turned around slowly to face the stranger. The man straddling the bike was staring back intently. After a few beats, Kakaru registered that the question had come from this man in front of him. Don't stop so suddenly. Let's cool down a bit, the man said. He started pedaling again at an easy pace. Why should I follow you? I don't even know who you are, Kakaru thought. But he still jogged after the man as if pulled by strings. As he stared at the back of the stranger in the doTERRA, Kakaru felt something like rage and amazement welling up inside of him. It had been a long time since someone had asked him whether he liked to run. He could have said, I like it, as casually as if the question were about some dish served in a meal, or he could have answered, I don't like it, as indifferently as tossing out the trash. Either way, it seemed impossible to Kakaru. I can't just answer a question like that, he thought. He simply found himself running every single day, though there wasn't any particular, anywhere in particular he wanted to go. How could anyone like him find it in himself to declare outright whether he liked or disliked running? 
The man on the bike gradually slowed down and came to a halt in front of a small shuttered shop. Cockaroo stopped too, and out of habit, he did some casual stretches to loosen his muscles. The guy bought two cans of cold tea from a vending machine, which emitted a dull glow, and he threw one to Cockaroo. They found themselves side by side, squatting in front of the shop. Cockaroo felt the coolness of the can in his hand, sucking the heat away from his body. I don't remember this happening in the anime. You run well. After a few moments of silence, the man said, Excuse me. He slowly stretched out his hand towards Cockaroo's calves. Cockaroo, feeling reckless, let him feel his legs over his jeans. Whatever. Who cares if this guy's a pervert? He was parched, so he gulped down the entire can of tea. The man checked Cockaroo's muth muscles methodically, like a doctor inspecting a patient's legs for any tumors. Then he looked up and fixed his eyes straight on Cockaroo. Why did you steal? After a beat, Cockaroo said bluntly, Who are you? He threw his empty can in the garbage bin next to the machine. I'm Haiji Kiyose, fourth year at Kansai University, faculty of letters. So he was at the university. Cockaroo was about to enter. Almost by reflex, he yelled. He yielded it and answered, I'm Kakuru Kakuhara, Kurahara. Thanks to growing up in a militantly hierarchical community since junior high school, Kakuru found it hard to be rude to more senior students. Nice name, Kakuru, the man remarked, calling his first name as though they'd already knew each other. You live around here? <laughs> I'll be starting Kansai in April. Oh, yeah. Kakuru couldn't help shrinking back as a peculiar gleam shot through Kyose's eyes. After all, he was the kind of guy who'd come chasing down a stranger on a bike to grope his legs. The man couldn't be sane. <laughs> well, I'll be off. Thank you for the tea. Kakuru tried to make a quick getaway, but Kyose didn't let him. He pulled on the hem of Kakuru's shirt and tried to force him back down. What department? Sociology. Why did you steal? They'd come full circle. Like an astronaut who couldn't escape the binding force of the Earth's gravity, Kakaru teeter tottered down to his seat again. Seriously, what do you want from me? Are you going to blackmail me? No, I don't mean anything like that. I just wondered if you're in a tight spot, maybe there's something I can do to help. Kakaru grew even more wary. <laughs> Kyose must have had some hidden agenda. There was no way he would just say something like that out of sheer goodwill. Now that I know you're a fellow student, I can't turn my back on you. Is it money? Well, yeah. Kakaru hoped Kyose might lend him some, but apparently all Kyose had on him were two plastic bowls and a bit of change in his pocket. Without offering any cash, he merely went on asking questions. Well, don't your parents send you money? They gave me money for a rental contract, but I used it all up on Mahjong games. Basically, I've got no choice but to sleep somewhere on campus till they... Send me money for the next month. So you're homeless. Seemingly lost in thought, Kyose leaned forward, gazing at the air around Kakaru's legs. Kakaru, feeling awkward, wiggled his toes inside of his sneakers. After a while, Kyose said earnestly, That sounds tough. If you'd like, I can introduce you to the landlord of the apartment I live in. There's just one room that's available right now. It's called Chikyuse, so... And it's close to here, a five-minute walk to campus, and, and the rent's 30,000 yen per year, per month. 30,000 yen? Kakaru stammered. He had to wonder what was behind that unbeatable price. Okay, real quick, I do want to know, based on this, how much the yen, the yen to dollar conversion is. Because 30,000 yen on my end with USD sounds a lot, but I don't think it's that much. Oh, so it's only $197 a month. Okay. <laughs> Which I, let's do inflation. So inflation of 2006 to now. Um, if we did inflation on that, let's do the dollar inflator just to know. Out of curiosity, I'm so curious. So if I did 197 in 2006, okay, that's $297.75 currently that's still a pretty good that's still a pretty good um rate three hundred dollars for rent a month depending on where you live that's not bad that's not bad he pictured a closet with blood oozing out from under the sliding doors or a pale apparition wandering the gloomy hallways and he shivered things like ghosts and paranormal activity made him nervous Ooh. 
The phenomena that occupied the murky in-between spaces of the world were incompatible with Cockrew's own world, where speed was everything, accurately measured in numerical values, a world where he could joyfully devote himself each day to building up the ideal body of a runner. Okay, so real quick, I love this idea. I, first of all, I love this book delving into the inner workings of Cockrew's mind, and we'll talk about that when this chapter is over, but I like the idea of establishing Cockrew not liking ghosts or the superstitious supernatural because it's not pragmatic and it's not concrete. He likes the concrete things he can do. He doesn't like the what if scenarios in the abstract. That's good to know. I also love that Kiyose comes across as the biggest weirdo at first, but we all know from the prologue, from Kiyose's perspective, why he's like this. So it's great. I love this. This is wonderful. But Kyose seemed oblivious to the inner turmoil in Kakaru, assuming his pained cry was that of a man who lost everything he had on Mahjong. It's all right. If we ask the landlord, he'll wait for your rent. At a cheek you say so, you don't have to pay security deposit, key money, or anything like that. Apparently, Kyose had already made up his mind. <laughs> Before Kakaru could say anything else, Kiyose had thrown out his empty can, straightened up, snapping up his bike's kickstand. Kakaru had nothing but serious misgivings about this apartment building, which housed such an eccentric character. Come on, let's go. I'll take you there, Kiyose urged him. But before we do that, we better pick up your stuff. Where have you been sleeping? Kakaru had found a spot on the side of the gym and had been huddled against the concrete wall to escape the wind and the rain. Oh my god! All the belongings he'd brought from home fit into a single duffel bag. He figured if he needed anything else, he could ask for it to be sent over. He'd casually left home with no clue where his next address would be, hopped on the train, and came to Tokyo. On his very first night, he went to a mahjong parlor and squandered all of his money. Even so, he wasn't worried or scared at all. He didn't mind being alone in a place where no one would, rec would recognize him. In fact, he even felt liberated. Still... He did want to settle in somewhere before the semester started, and he was sick of having to scrape by shoplifting at convenience stores on his jogging route. When Kakaru stood up obediently, Kiyose gave a satisfied nod. Instead of straddling the bike, he held it by the handles and pulled it along, the worn-out chain rattling noisily as he walked ahead. The frayed edges of his doTERRA looked white, lit up by the streetlights. Oddly enough, despite his obvious interest in the way Kakaru ran, Kyose didn't ask Kakaru anything about his experience in track. He didn't chide Kakaru for shoplifting either. Kakaru took a deep breath and called out to him. Why are you being so nice to me, Kyose? Kyose turned and smiled quietly, as though he'd just spotted a clump of fresh grass, green grass sprouting through the cracks in the asphalt. You can call me Haiji. Kakaru gave up interrogating Kyose and walked alongside him. No matter how cheap the place was, no matter how peculiar the residents were, staying there had to be better than sleeping outside. I can't believe that, like, I forgot that I didn't realize Cockrew was living, like, outside homeless because, and, and he just treats it so nonchalantly. He's like, I'll be fine. And it's like, I know people like Cockrew that do that. And I'm like, I don't know how you manage, but they do. And I also think it's important to know that Cockrew does have like a gambling problem because like the fact that he spent all of his money on Mahjong instead of being able to walk away clearly points into something like that, which maybe that's why he ends up gambling on the team to win. Not literally, but figuratively. So whatever. The apartment building was older than Cockrew had expected. So is this it, Haiji? Yes. This is Chikyusei-so. We call it Aotake. Kyose proudly looked up at the building in front of them. Kakaru could only stand there and gape at it. Other than the cultural heritage sites, it was the first time he'd seen such an old wooden building. The two-story structure had obviously been built on a low budget, and it looked as if it might collapse at any moment. <laughs> Kakaru could hardly believe anyone lived there, but alarmingly, some of the windows were glowing with a soft light. Chikyusei-so was about halfway between the university campus and the, and the Suru no Yu bathhouse. Just beyond the alley, the neighborhood was a mix of vegetable patches that had been there for many years and new apartment buildings, which were growing in numbers. Nestled in this setting stood Chikyusei-so, on a small plot of land bordered by dense green hedges. There was a gap on one side of the hedge instead of a gate where a visitor could peer into the premises. There was a wide graveled yard in front of the building, and one-story house stood on the left towards the back where the landlord probably lived. 
Unlike the apartment building, this house appeared to have been recently re-roofed with new tiles. The roof gave off a gentle sheen, reflecting the starlight. On its right was the infamous Chikuseso. There are nine rooms in total. Thanks to you, Kakaru, every room is now filled. The gravel crunched beneath Kiyose's feet as he guided Kakaru towards the entrance of the apartment building. The quaint sliding door was latticed and filled with a thin sheet of glass. The light above it flickered fitfully, hooded by an oblong cover that had been trapped, a mass of tiny flies. Kakaru squinted at the wooden plate hanging next to the door, trying to make out the name on the sooty light. The kanji letters, handwritten in cursive, with a valiant flourish, seemed to read Chikyusei So, the lodging of green bamboo. Kyose parked the bike in a random spot in the yard, and carrying the plastic bowls stacked under his arm, he put his hand on the front door. I'll introduce you to the others later. We're all students at Kansei. There's a little trick to this, he added, as he hitched up the sliding door in its groove and tugged it open at the same time. Inside the threshold, the Ginkan space consisted of a concrete floor for entering with shoes and a lidded shoe cupboard on one side, which evidently doubled as a mailbox. There were horizontal lines cut in the lid, and someone had scribbled each room number on a scrap of paper and stuck them on with tape. All the labels were browned from the sun. From a quick look at the row of numbers, Kakaru saw that there were four rooms on the first floor and five on the second. The stairs to the second floor were on the right in front of the Ginkan entrance. Kakaru didn't even need to walk on it to see that the steps were uneven. He wondered how this building was still standing. <laughs> I love that, that that's being called into question. Kiyose took off his sandals on the concrete floor. Come on in, he prompted Kakaru. Kakaru did as he was told and put his shoes on the box labeled 103. Just then he heard someone call, hey, IG. The sound made him jump and look around, but no one was there. Kyose frowned suspiciously. Up here, the voice said. Kakaru and Kyose looked up at the ceiling. For some reason, Kakaru couldn't fathom. There was a fist-sized hole right above them. Whoever had spoken was pressing his face against the floor above, and I, with mischievous gleam, peered at them through the hole. Joji, Kyose grumbled. What's that hole doing there? Put a foot through the floor. Well, wait there. I'm coming up. Though he seemed disgruntled, Kyose's bearing was calm as he started up the stairs. Kakaru hesitated and then decided to go after him. As soon as Kakaru put his foot down on a stair, it gave a high-pitched squeak like a nightingale, floors and old castles and temples. Kakaru climbed all the way up the dark, steep stairs and surveyed the second floor. The ceiling was higher than he expected. There were two doors next to the staircase, probably leading to a toilet and a sink, respectively, and two more rooms beyond that. Across the hallway, there were three rooms. The whole floor was quiet, but light fell through the crack of the door facing the staircase labeled 201. With firm steps, Kiyose approached room 201 and swung the door open without knocking. Kakaru hung back, peeking through the doorway. The room was roughly 160 square feet, fitting about 10 tatami mats, with a low table in the middle and two futons laid out on either side. There seemed to be two people living here. Books and random junk were scattered across the futons, which looked as though they'd been left lying there for days. What stood out the most were the tenants themselves. Two young men with the exact same face were looking at Kyose beseechingly. Kakaru peered closely at the twins, but he could hardly spot a difference between the two. I told you to be careful. Which of you made the hole? Kyose declared coldly, his hands on his hips. The twins, who had been huddled together, started babbling at once. Well, it was Joda. It was Joji. Hey, that's not fair. Don't blame me. But you're the one that made the hole bigger. Well, I just fell through the hole that you made. Even their voices were the same. Kyose silenced them by putting up his right hand. Didn't I warn you that the floorboards above Ginkan were getting weaker? Room 201 was covered with tatami mats, but one rectangle of the floor just above the entrance hall was bare wood. The twins nodded in sync at Kyose's approach. Oh, we did try to be careful. We were just walking over it as usual. It's not like they were, we were stomping. It just snapped out of nowhere. You can't just walk over these floorboards like it's nothing. They'll break, Kyose snorted. From now on, be careful as you can when you step on them. Got it? The twins nodded readily again. Kyose cautiously knelt on the floor and inspected the hole. Um, hi, G, one of the twins called hesitantly. What? Who's that? The twins were looking at Kakaru, who was still hovering in the doorway. Ah, Kyose glanced back as if he had just remembered his companion. 
Kakaru Kurahara. He'll be going to Kansai starting this spring, like you two. He's moving in today. Kakaru stepped into the room and next to the low table, giving a small nod. The twins greeted him in unison. Hi there, nice to meet you. Kakaru meet the Joe twins. Taro Joe is the older brother, and Jiro Joe is the younger. The brothers each gave a slight bow as they were introduced. If they swapped places now, Kakaru wouldn't be able to tell them apart. Call me Joji, and he's Joda, Jiro, Jiro said with an easygoing smile. That's what everyone calls us. Wonder if we could use that hole for something. What do you think, Kakaru? Taro asked. As if they'd known each other. Kakaru mumbled something vague, overwhelmed by the chatty twins. I guess we'll just have to cover it up with a magazine or something. Kyose stood up and announced, looking down at the gap, Did you hurt your legs when it happened? No, not at all. The twins shook their head in sync, relieved to see that Kyose's anger had abated. If the twins are so afraid of them, Kakaru thought, I guess Haiji's the one who calls all the shots at Chikyu say so. Kakaru let out a heavy sigh, contemplating the communal life that awaited him in this old house. Wherever he went, it seemed impossible to escape cliques and hierarchy. Ooh, interesting, which is going to tie back to the authoritative coach later on. I haven't even shown Kakaru his room yet. Just make sure you don't break anything else in Aotake, all right? With that warning, Kyose was gone. The twins saw Kakaru off at the door, talking in chorus. Too bad it's only your first night and you've already seen how the place is falling apart. The house is nice and quiet, though. You'll see. Kakaru bade them good night and followed Kyose, who was already headed downstairs. The brothers were right. An air of stillness pervaded Chikyuseso. Despite all the noise the twins had made, there was no sign of the other residents, who might have been out. The only sounds Kakaru could hear were the rustling of leaves in the neighborhood and cars passing on some distant roads. Through the front door, which was left wide open, a night breeze drifted in, warmer now than it was in spring, carrying a soft scent of earth from the vegetable patches. Kakaru picked up a duffel bag they'd left by the front door. The freshly made hole above was already covered up with a magazine, which had a woman in a bathing suit on the front cover. Now that the magazine blocked the light from the twins' bedroom, the entrance hall felt dim. For the first time, Kakaru could take his time to look closely at the first floor of the building. The floor plan was more or less the same as the second, and the hallway extended in a straight line from the front door. On the left, the closest room to the entrance was the kitchen, followed by rooms 101 and 102. The twins' room, 201, was just above the entrance hall in the kitchen, which meant the second floor had one bedroom more than the first. Room 101, where Kyose lived, was right under 202, 102 was under 203, and so on. The right side of the first floor hallway was exactly the same as the second floor. There were two doors for the toilet and the sink next to the staircase, then rooms 103 and 104 came after those, under rooms 204 and 205, respectively. Kyose offered to show him around, and Kagura was about to walk further than the hallway when he stopped dead in his tracks. The deep end of the hall was hazy with thick white smoke. Is that a fire, Haiji? But Kyose merely muttered, oh, that. And he was about to explain when the door to room 102 in the far left corner banged open. Someone shot out from inside. Kakaru expected him to flee from the fire, but instead he came running to the front door and he hammered on door 104. Hey, come out, Nico-senpai. He pounded on the door a dozen times so hard that all the doors on the floor shook until it finally opened. Oh, quiet down, Yuki. Kakaru thought he could make out a tall, shadowy figure slowly emerging from the room, but the smoke was too dense. The two launched into a fierce argument, oblivious to Kakaru and Kyose standing by the kitchen. Your cigarette smoke comes all the way into my room. Lucky you, you get to enjoy it without buying a single pack. But I don't smoke! Anyway, it's really annoying, so I'd appreciate it if you didn't. The resident of room 102 flailed his arms to fan away the smoke, muttering, See, look how thick it is! The toxic fumes coiled towards Kakaru and Kyose. Now Kakaru could smell the tobacco. He was relieved it wasn't a fire, but the clash between the two was escalating. Do you know how much noise you make? The smoker attacked, playing crazy-ass music at max volume all night long. I can hear it going boom, chicka boom, chicka boom, 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 boom. It's gonna give me nightmares. I put headphones, I put on headphones when it's late. But it's still leaking, and those boom chickas drive me up a wall. It's an old building. You have to live with some noise. I wouldn't let my smoke out either if I could help it. It's because the door doesn't fit properly. All right, that's enough. Kyose clapped to get their attention. 
right on time. I'll introduce you to our new resident. When the fight quieted down, it was clear that heavy bass beats laced with electronic noise were flowing out of room 102, and dense white smoke like dry ice was swirling out of room 104. Kakaru didn't feel like going anywhere near them, <laughs> but Kyose didn't seem to mind. With the wind taken out of their sails, the two residents waited with their fists in the air and mouths hanging open for Kyose and the newcomer to reach them. Senpai, Yuki, this is Kakaru Kurahara, who will be living in 103 starting today. A first year in sociology, Kakaru, this is Akihiro Hirata in 104, a longtime resident of Chikyusei, so everyone calls him Nico Senpai. Because he's the dark lord of nicotine. <laughs> the one called Yuki side. His music booming in the background. Kyose pressed on. Nico Senpai will be a third year in science and engineering this spring. When I first arrived, he was my senpai, a year ahead of me, but we've swapped places since then. Nico senpai, big and burly like a bear, nodded to Kakaru without a hint of a smile. So you'll be my next door neighbor, huh? Good to meet ya. Judging from his stubble and brazen attitude, Kakaru couldn't imagine Nico senpai being an undergrad. Kakaru whispered to Kyose, um, how many years can you stay at university? Eight years. Nico added, I'm still in my fifth. Yuki, whose real name Kakaru still didn't know, snapped, plus you failed the entrance exam two years in a row. Kakaru did a quick mental calculation. That meant Nico Senpai was 25 this year, but his self-possessed air made him seem older. He kept his cool despite Yuki's snide remarks. Kakaru wanted to steer clear of the secondhand smoke, but Nico Senpai seemed, to, seemed like someone who'd be easy to get along with. Finally, Kyose got around to introducing the other resident. Kakaru, this is Yukihiko Iwakura. He's in the law faculty and a fourth year like me. We call him Yuki. He might not look like it, but he already passed the bar exam. Hey, Yuki said bluntly. He was sickly pale, fitting for his name, which basically meant snowboy. His spindly figure and glasses made him look rather neurotic. I better not cross this guy. <laughs> Kakaru thought! <laughs> Okay. Nice. Nico pulled out a cigarette from his pocket and lit it, apparently indifferent to Yuki's icy stare. By the way, Haiji, I heard a racket upstairs a little while ago. Did something happen? The twins, surprise, surprise, knocked a hole in the floor. That didn't take long, Nico chuckled. Those two are idiots, Yuki frowned. We let them have the biggest room at Aotake, but it's pointless if they can't use the corner anymore. That side was getting worn out, so it was only a matter of time. We have to come up with a way to fortify it, Kyose said. Yuki narrowed his eyes. If you ask me, it's Prince's fault. As Kyose and Yuki talked, Kakaru and Nico stood there like bystanders. With an incredible lung capacity, Nico soon turned the cigarette nearly to ash and stubbed the butt out on his own door. The lung capacity, the legs. Oh, I love that it's just building up that they're all have features that would make them good at running. <laughs> you know, the spindly figure on Yuki, the lung capacity on Nico, the legs on the twins. I love it. Hey, Kakaru. Nico also skipped formalities and went straight to his first name basis just as the twins had done. I just made a shocking discovery. What is it? All three of you have the same names as characters from a classic anime. Oh, Kakaro didn't know much about anime, so he could only give a lukewarm response. Nico pointed at each of them in turn with his second cigarette pinched between his fingers. He's Haiji, like Heidi Girl the Alps, right? Kakaro's last name is Kurahara, so he's Clara. And then there's Yuki, like Snowflake the Little Goat. See? Don't turn me into a goat! Yuki shoved Nico back into 104. Feel free to call me Peter. The goat hurt! Ignoring Nico, Yuki banged the door shut in his face. He spun around and stormed back into his own room, slamming the door behind him. Only the lingering traces of smoke and music drifted into the dark hallway. Um. Kakaru was at a loss for words. Kyose responded with a shrug. Don't worry about it. They're always like that. But I'm glad they took a liking to you. They liked me? Really? Kakaru was even more baffled, but he kept quiet as he watched Kyose walk back to room 103 and open the door. So this is your room, and here's the key. Kyose pointed out the brass key with a round head hanging on the inner side of the door. When you want to lock your room from the inside, you have to insert this into the keyhole from your side, just like you'd lock it from the outside. Most of the time we can't be bothered, so we just keep our doors unlocked when we're in. Kakaru took the dull golden key. It had an old-fashioned shape, 
like a key that might be used to open a magic door. The guilt was coming off in some places, and after being handled by generations of residents, the edges had rubbed away into a homely roundness. Kyose went in and opened the window, letting in the fresh air. The six-mat room, about 100 square feet, had a built-in osiri closet with sliding doors. Kakaru slid open the door apprehensively, just in case. He was afraid he'd find bloodstains or something, but in spite of its age, the room was nice and clean. I'll show you a shop where you can borrow a futon tomorrow. You'll have to make do with just my blanket for tonight. I I'll bring it over later, Kyose said. Thank you. There's a toilet and sink on each floor. We take turns cleaning it. The roster's put up in the kitchen at the start of each month. You've just moved in, so you're off the hook in April. I make breakfast and dinner for everyone. All by yourself? Just something simple. For lunch, everyone gets their own food. When you don't need breakfast and dinner, just let me know the day before. Kyose reeled off the house rules without pause. For baths, you could head to Suru no you over there, or you could just use the bath at the landlord's house. For the landlords, the bath is available between 8 and 11 p.m. No need to reserve it beforehand or wash the bathtub afterwards. It's a hobby of the landlords washing the bath. Okay, Kakuru paid close attention to everything Kyose said to commit it to memory. There's no curfew or anything like that. If you're unsure about something, just ask. What times are the meals? It depends on everyone's schedule, so we just warm stuff up whenever we want. I guess most people eat around 8.30 in the morning and around 7.30 at night. Got it. Kakuru nodded and then bowed more properly. Thank you for everything. Kyose smiled again. Even though Kakaru has suspected some hidden motive behind his invitation to Chikusei so far, now that he'd met half the residents, it was hard to remain skeptical. Everyone he'd met so far, including Kyosei, was a little eccentric, but they'd welcomed Kakaru with open arms. There wasn't anything pushy about Kyosei's expression either. It was a reserved smile, not overly friendly. From the direction of the kitchen, Kakaru heard one bong from the wall clock. 10.30, Kyosei said glancing at the plastic washing bowls they had left near the front door as if he was just remembering them. You can still take a bath at the landlord's. If you're not too tired, do you want to go up to the main house? I'll introduce you. They went out again, Kiyose offering a pair of sandals so Kakaru wouldn't have to take out his shoes every time. Apparently the residents of the Chikyuseso were a fan of massage sandals. Several pairs have been cast off around the Ginkin. They crossed the garden on the gravel path towards the one-story wooden house where the landlord lived. It wasn't much of a garden, in fact, just some tall trees planted along the hedges, suitable for casting shade, which didn't seem particularly looked after. A white station wagon was parked nearby. It looked as though it was just left there on a whim. As indifferently as the garden had been designed, and the yard didn't seem to have a particular parking space. For a house in the metropolitan area, it was a rather extravagant way of using the land. It's interesting because in the anime it makes it seem like I always thought that the bath was in the same of house as them and their residence, but here it's like in another building. So that's interesting. All right. Now that he'd found a place to live, Kakaru felt a personal connection to this neighborhood for the first time. Before he came to Tokyo, he'd imagined it to be grimy and a restless city. He took a deep breath, filling his lungs with the night air. Surprisingly, it wasn't like that. In Tokyo, just like everywhere else, people were going about their ordinary lives. It was no different from the town where he was born and raised. He could sense the everyday lives of the residents, who tried to make a comfortable home by planting hedges and laying out a garden. In the dark, Kakaru heard the huffing and puffing of some excitable creature that seemed to have detected their footsteps. When he strained his eyes, he could make out a brown mutt coming out from under the Ingawa veranda of the main house, wagging its tail furiously. I forgot about an important resident. Kyose knelt down and stroked the dog's head. This is Nira, the landlord's dog. That's a weird name, Nira, like garlic cloves, garlic chives. Kakaru squatted next to Kyose, peer and peered into the dog's wet black eyes. An older student who lived in the Aotake brought him home, Kyose explained, picking up Nira's droopy ears with his fingers and pointing them up. In Okinawa, they call paradise Nira something, apparently. I can't remember what it was. Anyway, that's where the name comes from. Paradise, huh? The dog did look though he didn't have a care in the world. And he had the kind of face that would win over anyone. The name was perfect. He's a silly dog who's friendly with everybody, but he's cute. Kyose played with the dog, tugging his ears and stroking out the curl in his tail, but Nira just looked at the two of them with an adoring expression. Kakaru patted the dog, too, as a greeting. 
Nero wore a bright red leather collar. It looks good on you, Kakaru whispered to him. Oh, that's so cute! The landlord was a hale and hearty old man named Genichiro Tazaki. When Kyoshi explained Kakaru's situation with a bit of dramatizing here and there and asked the landlord to wait a while for the rent, he acquiesced without batting an eye. It was only when he heard Kakaru's name that there was a slight change in his expression. Kakaru Kurahara. You're not Kurahara from Sendai Jose Junior High School, are you? Tazaki burst out and then nearly had a coughing fit, his face contorting as though he'd gotten sprayed by seawater. It was impossible to tell whether he was irritated or excited. Kakaru's whole body tensed up, ready to face someone who might know of his past. His suspicions about Kyosei's motives for bringing him to Chikusei so welled up again and it made him feel sick. Kakaru had had enough of that kind of world that he'd come from. A world in which he was forced to run only for the sake of breaking records, at the mercy of his teammates' jealousy and rivalry. He never wanted to go back to that life if he could help it. Kakaru stood rooted in place, his face cast down and stiff. Noticing the change in him, the landlord didn't press him any further. Well, hope you get along with everyone. Try not to wreck the apartment. That was the old, all the old man said promptly before retiring to the living room where the TV was on. Kakaru glanced at Kyose thinking about the fresh hole in the ceiling. Keep quiet about that, said Kyose. As long as we don't make the whole building collapse, he won't come to check. The bathroom was at the back of the house, and there was also a large laundry machine in the changing room. A piece of paper bearing the words, Laundry before 10 p.m., underwear should be pre-washed, was pinned to the wall with a thumbtack. The notice was written with a calligraphy brush in a flowing, bold style, like a decorative scroll hanging in the, taka, in the Tokonoma alcove at a traditional inn. Kakaru was distracted by the stark gap between the majestic calligraphy and the content on the note when the door to the dark bathroom suddenly opened from inside. A black man stepped out of the steam into the changing room. Kakaru sprang back and bumped into a laundry machine. The man looked at them in mild surprise. Well, good evening, Haiji, he said in a very natural accent as he dried himself with a towel. And this is... Kakaru Kurahara, he's a newcomer. Kakaru, this is Musa Kamala, an exchange student. He lives in 203, a second year in science and engineering. Pleasure to meet you, Kakaru. Still naked from head to toe, Musa held out his hand in a flawless gesture. Kakaru took it awkwardly, not used to shaking hands. Musa was about the same height as Kakaru, and his eyes had a calm, thoughtful depth to them. Since the other residents had been on the rowdy side, Kakaru felt a little relieved to meet someone who looked like he might be a peaceful person with some common sense. There was something that puzzled Kakaru, though. Why were you bathing in the dark, he asked. Musa beamed. To train myself, he said. Going in the water when it's dark makes us feel great unease. But I do so deliberately in order to reflect on myself. Perhaps you could challenge yourself too, Kakaru. What is this? This Musa's refined Japanese sounded stiff for casual conversation, which made it amusing in a peculiar way. I'll give it a try, Kakaru replied. Yet another weirdo. <laughs> I love it! Kiyose and Musa left the changing room, and Kakaru let out a sigh alone at last. He took off his clothes, switched on the light in the bathroom, and scrubbed his body in the shower area. He hadn't been able to go to a bathhouse, so it was the first time in a while that he cleaned his body properly. When he was done washing, he decided to turn off the light. Just as Musa had said, it felt somewhat unsettling to bathe in the dark. Besides, it was first time in the house. Since he didn't have... A feel for where things were, he knocked his shin against the step inside the tub, which he probably had installed for the elderly landlord. He groped around the tub and settled down, stretching out his legs. The water, starting to get lukewarm, felt heavy in the dark. Each movement of his body sent ripples through the water, and the darkness made the lapping feel louder than usual, too. Kakru closed his eyes. He thought about this new chapter in his life. His fears and misgivings floated in the water around him. He saw the bitterly disappointed faces of his parents, who had dismissed him with a brusque, We'll send you enough for the living costs. Do what you like. He saw the oval track where he used to run every single day and the rows of houses nearby. He saw his teammates slamming their lockers shut as they threw him contemptuous looks. All this rushed into his head, and he sank until his nose was submerged underwater. 
He was running out of air, but he didn't budge. Instead, he started counting his own heartbeat out of habit. He was used to this feeling. Countless times while running, he would felt like he was suffocating, much worse than the tightness in his chest that he felt now. Many times, his lungs had filled up with blood, and he could taste it at the back of his throat. Still, he kept running. But why? Was it because he felt pleasure when he ran? Or was it because he didn't want to admit defeat to anyone, least of all himself? His heart was pounding so hard, he could pinpoint exactly where it was inside of him. He pressed his wet hands over his ears, but the booms resonated throughout his entire body until it felt overwhelming. At last, Cockrew rose above the water and has breathed in a deep opening his eyes at the same time. Through the window, he saw the shadowy shape of Chikuseso next door. More windows were lit up now. Soft squares of light fell on the yard outside, which was engulfed in darkness. Maybe Musa likes to look at this view from the bath, Kakaru thought. When he returned to his new room at Chiguseso, he found that Kyose had left him a blanket. He heard the creaks and groans of the old building in every corner of the room, especially from the ceiling. It sounded as if something was taking an endless supply of dry branches and snapping them into pieces. This is going to be my home from now on. Kakaru laid down and pulled up the blanket. He caught a whiff of the grassy scent of the tatame mat. The house was still creaking, but compared to sleeping out in the open, it felt he felt much more at ease. When he closed his eyes, sleep came to him at once. I love it! I we still got a few more pages left, but I love I love Musa and the first impression we get of him. It's played more for comedy in the anime, but here it's like insightful, and I like that we get that with his character. And I like that we I like that we're getting Kakaru in his own head and getting to see his thoughts and like where his mind is at. Because when you watch the anime, it's like you see this stuff happen, but you don't exactly know what's going through his head. And then the idea that the landlord instantly knew who he was is, is interesting. Musa Kamala parted from the Kyose as they entered Chikuse. So, and went up the stairs to his own room last spring when Musa, Oh, is this from Musa's perspective? Last spring, when Musa had just arrived, he couldn't bring himself to feel safe in a wooden house, and he'd been nervous even just to walk down the hallway. He grew up in a western colonial-style house made of stone. Before he came here, he couldn't have imagined what it was like to live in a house where the walls were so thin he could hear voices from the next room, where the hallways were so narrow it was a struggle for two people to pass each other. But by now, Musa had grown very fond of Chikuseso, both the building itself and his fellow residents. Musa thought about Kakaru the newcomer that he had just met. He had hoped they'd get along too. He recalled how nimble Kakaru was on his feet. He probably played some kind of sport. And the strong-willed eyes that looked at Musa with slight bewilderment. I bet he'll fit in here in no time, Musa thought. Of the three rooms on the left side of the hallway, Musa's was the last one. And he noticed that the door in the middle of room 202 was slightly ajar. He popped his head in as he passed by. The occupant of 202, Yohei Sagaguchi, a fourth year in sociology. He was watching TV with Takashi Sugiyama, a third year in business who lived across from Musa in room 205. Good evening, Musa said, since he felt like talking to someone. The two turned around and casually invited him in. They gave him a sweaty can of beer and Musa sat up straight on the totemy, folding his legs underneath him. Are you watching a quiz show again, King? Musa said mildly, as astonished as the celebrities on the screen raced to push the buzzer button. Sakaguchi's hobby was to watch every single quiz show, even recording them on video when he couldn't catch them in real time. Everyone at Chikyu Say So called him King, as in Quiz King, to tease him just a bit. Well, what else would I watch? He replied, just as he thwacked a tissue box with his hand and shouted at the top of his voice, The public baths of, Car of Caracalla! The tissue box was a substitute for a buzzer. You'll never get bored if you watch quiz shows with King. Sugiyama laughed, inviting Musa to drink the beer. He's so dramatic. Sugiyama's nickname was Shindo. At first, Musa couldn't understand how someone so soft-spoken could be called Shindo, which meant a quake. When Shindo had first noticed Musa's confusion, he cleared things up right away. You see, I was born in a village deep in the mountains. It takes me two days to return home from Tokyo. Oh, do you know this word for return? Yes, but does it really take two whole days? Even when I, when I fly back to my home country, it only takes a little over a day. Hmm? So in terms of the time it takes, my hometown is even farther away than yours, Musa. That puts things in perspective. It really is a remote village. Oh, do you know remote? 
I'm not sure. Do you mean it's in the countryside? Yeah, exactly. And in my village, I used to be called a Shindo. Well, just a local one anyway. Uh, Shindo literally means a child of God. And it's what you call a child prodigy. I like how he's kind of like testing Musa and like quizzing his like Japanese as he's talking to him. It's interesting. Most residents of Chick You Say So use slang when they talk to Musa without pausing to check whether he understood. There we go. Though his Japanese was above the intermediate level, Musa was often at a loss when it came to colloquialisms. But Shindo was an exception. He always offered a thorough definition for any slang or difficult vocabulary that Musa might not be familiar with. It was thanks to him that Musa grew even more fluent in Japanese. Musa knew more slang words now, but he tried to avoid using them, emulating Shindo's courteous manner instead. Sometimes Nico senpai from downstairs would joke, hearing you talk makes my shoulders go stiff. Musa looked on at the quiz show for a while, sipping his beer. The only residents at Chikuseiso who owned a TV were King, the twins, and Nico. Nico's room was full of toxic fumes, so everyone else stayed away for the most part. King's TV was exclusively used for quiz shows, so whenever there was a program they wanted to watch, they usually headed to the twins' room. Musa could hear the TV in the twins' room next door, but no talking. The brothers seemed to be enjoying a quiet evening by themselves, left in peace by their raucous seniors. King was shouting answers at the screen and smacking the tissue box as enthusiastically as ever. As soon as the commercial break started, he snatched up the remote and fast-forwarded. Musa realized they'd been watching a recording the whole time. King skipped over the commercials and resumed the show. This time it wasn't a buzzer round. He finally pulled himself away from the TV a little. Hey Musa, Shindo's been watching the quiz without uttering a single word. Can you believe it? Musa cocked his head, not quite following King's point. King swiveled around to face Musa and Shindo, who were sitting side by side. Come on, no one can help calling out the answers when you're watching a quiz show. Isn't that human nature? I mean, if you hear a question like, what kanji character do you get when you put together the fish radical and the kanji for blue? You've got to answer mackerel. But this guy, he just sits there. What's the fun in watching, right? I noticed you like to call out the answers even when you're watching by yourself, said Musa thinking back to all the nights he'd heard King through the wall yelling random words. Obviously, but that's the whole point of quiz shows. I just don't get why anybody would want to sit through it like a statue. I don't know about that, said Mu Musa thought. I don't know about that. Shindo countered out loud. I think you're actually in the minority. In my view, I don't understand why you get so fired up about it when you're not even a contestant. Why don't you apply to compete in one of those shows, Musa added. They all knew how zealous King was about quiz questions, surfing around on quiz-related websites on a daily basis. King even dared to step into the hellhole of smoke that everyone shied away from just to research quizzes on Nico's computer. The residents regarded King's fervor for quizzes from a safe distance. A true connoisseur knows the best way to enjoy quizzes is to watch them from the other side of the screen and answer more quickly, accurately, and copiously than any famed champion, King declared proudly. As brash as it seemed, King was actually prone to stage fright, so it was unthinkable for him to go on TV. When Musa sensed the truth behind King's bravado, he didn't press the matter. Shindo nodded along and good-naturedly good said, I guess you're right. King seemed slightly uncomfortable, so Musa changed the subject. Have you heard we have a new resident here? Since when? What's he like? King and Shindo jumped at the news. It clearly excited their curiosity. King even turned down the volume of the TV. A little startled by their eagerness, Musa told them about the encounter outside of the bath. I believe he arrived tonight. Haiji said he'll be starting in the Faculty of Sociology this spring. Haiji looked happy. I've got a bad feeling about this. <laughs> King muttered. Why so? Kakuru looked like a nice, honest person, said Musa. It's not his personality that King's concerned about, Musa, Shindo explained. Do you know Haiji, Do you know how Haiji was so keen to fill Room 103, don't you? Well, yeah, what about it? That's the big question, King said. He propped his elbow on his knee and theatrically stroked his chin. Musa, you must have heard Haiji muttering the same thing over and over these days. One more, just one more. He's like that ghost who obsesses over the tenth missing plate in Bancho Sariashiki. What's Bancho Sariashiki? Musa asked. Let me explain, Shindo began, but King cut him off. He's definitely up to something, a secret plot. I wonder... Why it's so important for Haiji to have ten people in Aotake, Shindo frowned. With an air of gravity, King began to spin a hypothesis. It's my fourth year living here, but we've never had ten tenants. Pun unintended. We know, go on. We've never had ten tenants at the same time since there are only nine rooms, naturally. But this year it's different. 
the twins moved into 201, and that was when Haiji started chanting the mantra like a ghost, just one more. It's true, Haiji did seem fixated on having 10 people, Musa agreed. Normally, Kyose wasn't the expressive type. No matter what kind of commotion the others stirred up at Chikyuseiso, Kyose stayed calm and collected. But when it came to whether a new tenant would move into room 103, he seemed worried sick. It was almost bizarre how he made his concern so obvious. Musa had also wondered what could be on his mind. What on earth is going on to happen when there's 10 people in the house? Musa said, no clue. King tossed the question out the window as quickly as he'd taken it up. Maybe we'll see a ghost who counts plates. You're the one who made a fuss about a secret plot. The least you could do is put more thought into it, Shindo complained. But King had turned back to the TV and was already absorbed in the quiz, and, and they couldn't get anything more out of him except monosyllabic, monosyllabic grunts. Shindo and Musa debated Haiji's true intentions for a little while longer, but eventually they left the matter unsettled. Silence fell over room 202. Even the quiz show went quiet, a dramatic pause awaiting the contestant's answer. Whatever it is, King said, if anything bad was going to happen to us, I'm sure Haiji would tell us about it. I mean, he sure as hell won't get off your back if you forget to clean the bathroom when it's your turn, but other than that, he's a pretty good guy. He's right, Musa thought. Kyose would never make them walk into a trap. Musa couldn't imagine anything bad in store for them. Kyose looked too happy for that when Musa saw him earlier. Kyose looked as excited as Musa had been the last year when he'd seen a carpet of snow for the first time in his life. Ah, okay. Holy cow. Well, this video was longer than 30 minutes. <laughs> wow. I actually kind of love the setup of this. So one thing I really like is like in the first episode of the series, you meet all the characters at once. And so this was kind of like the first episode. This first chapter was like the first episode, <laughs> surprising no one. Um, but what I really like about it is that we we don't just get the story from one person's perspective. We get the prologue from Haiji's perspective. We get the start of the chapter from Kakaru's perspective. And then I like that Kakaru goes to sleep and we get this last part here from the perspective of King, Shindo, and Musa, who already we can see their friendship and stuff developing. So we haven't met Prince yet. Prince is the only one we haven't met, right? I think so. I think Prince is the only one we still haven't met yet. But other than Prince, we kind of have gotten like a little glimpse into each of the characters. We know about their personalities. It's very interesting so far. And all the foreshadowing is there. All the foreshadowing in this, in this first chapter. Oh, I'm living. So... I'm so excited. Yes. I, I'm curious to know what you all think down below. Um, I'm going to read chapter two next time and go from there. I'm super excited. Um, I'm hoping to try to do a chapter each week leading up to New Year's, but we'll just see how timing and everything on the channel goes. But we'll just have to wait and see. Haha. -ha. Anyway. I'm super excited. I hope you all are as well. I'm curious to know your thoughts down below of what you think of this dramatic reading of Run With The Wind, but I'm liking the little tiny tweaks from the anime so far, and I'm curious to see getting inside of Kakaru's mind where we go to from here. So I hope you all have a wonderful week. Please stay safe. Take care. And yeah, I'll be back very soon with more of Run With The Wind. Bye.